and every one of you here we are uh under expectation that the lord's going to do something for us today if not then we would have probably went somewhere else but thank god that we're here amen you love the lord i want to thank josh for getting this so i don't have to bring that big computer up here anymore we've got it right here so we're going to see if we can do that today so uh good to have each and every one of you here sister amari good to see you always and then um brother ben always good to have you with us well sometime not all the time Sometimes. Just come be with us anytime you want to. Amen. Bible says, Lo, I'll be with you always. Come down south, brother. There's a quote that said, There's nothing impossible to those who will try. The way to get started is quit talking and begin doing. So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna we're going to uh have the meeting this afternoon and and um I Pray that the uh, brothers would uh, would be here. I, if if I go a little bit over twelve, then we might wait to one thirty. But it's going to be between one and one thirty. We won't have any song service. It'll just be right into uh, the things that we need to uh, to discuss. And uh, thank God for the baptism last week. We had four baptized, and and we're looking for more. Remember Sister Kathy and her uh, the death of her mother. And she passed away f three years ago. Brother Ray passed away same day. Three years ago. I uh, don't seem like it's been that long since he's gone, but but uh, the same day. So let's just remember Sister Kathy and her family. And remember, too, that um, Sister Regina's in Michigan. Brother John Durrett sent me a message this morning. He's visiting his dad in Macon. So we have a few out, but every everybody that's supposed to be here is here. All right? And today, this afternoon, uh, for those of you that are on live streaming, there will be no live streaming this afternoon. All right, it will be it will be archived and it will be uh, private and it will be just for the people of the church. So don't call Brother Joe at two o'clock and say my internet's not working because it won't be. All right, so just um, bear with us and. Uh, and pray for us, and uh, we'll get through this. All right. And now, also, Brother Luis will be speaking for us this coming Wednesday night. 
Also remember the July 19th, 20th, 21st, Brother Andre came back to the house a couple of days ago, and and uh, they're really excited about us coming again. So let's kind of keep that in our prayer. So all minds clear. Remember the ones that are sick. Sister Johnny talked to her a few days ago, and uh, I think Mom and, and some of the sisters went down to visit. And uh, we just keep her in prayer. That's all we can do. Prayer, prayer is the most powerful thing we can give them. And then give her encouragement. So if you need want to call her and give her encouragement, call and give her encouragement. She sure would love to, to hear from you. So, all right. So let's bow our heads. Lord, thank you for this day you give us for the people that you, that you are called by your name, Lord. And as we were talking last week, Lord, about your name, the baptism, and 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 bringing a family name in into view, Lord. And today, Lord, uh, the family has assembled in your name. Father, you said whatsoever two or three gathered together, you'd be there in the midst. And, Lord, you're an an a prayer-answering God. So, Lord, I pray that you'd comfort Sister Kathy. I pray that you'd comfort each one, Lord, that's sick. Sister Johnny, Lord, Sister Mary Darty, different ones that we haven't seen in a while. Sister Gail, Lord, I pray that you'd touch each one of them. Father, just be with us in the further of this service. Just baptize us all with the Holy Ghost, Lord. Just bring us things where we can see you and know you better. We've come here to hear from you, Father, so move this vessel out of the way, Father, and you take over and you do the speaking. And, Father, you be the active participant in this service. So thank you for all things. We ask your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Let's go to Revelations 1, verse 10. The Bible says, I was in the Spirit. Y'all can see that in the back, I hope. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Did y'all see that uh, post where the uh, all the uh, prior uh, eclipse that went across America, it makes those two signs, the alpha sign and the omega sign in the heaven. God's fixing to do something. He's bringing this omega bride to view one more time. As Brother Brown saw that in the vision, one more time he's bringing that omega bride into view so that the world can see that God's in control Absolutely. and where he is. Yes. They're all looking for him to come. You hear the songs of, you know, we want you to come, Lord. We want you to come. He's not going to come the way they're talking. That's right. He's here in his bride. He's already here visible on the earth in a, in a people, but that's hard for them to believe just like it was hard for them to believe Jesus was almighty God. Amen. Amen. But I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake to me. And what did he see? He turned, he saw seven candlesticks. So he saw, he, he thought he was going to see Jesus standing there. He saw a scene. All right? And he saw someone standing in that scene. He knew who Jesus was. He'd seen him all of his life, you know, most of his life. But he saw him in a form he'd never seen him before. He saw him in the form of the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to the foot and girded about the paps with a golden girdle. We know that's in bride form, all right? So now, Revelation 1, 16, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. You may be seated, and the Lord has blessing to the reading of his word. We're going to get into the Pergamon church age today, but I was thinking yesterday of Oh, all the all that's being preached about stars, and we talk about our messenger and how the star led us to Christ. You know, you're part of that star. You know, you're part of that star. You, you're you're not the star. There's seven stars, seven messengers, but you're a part of that star. We are a part of that and recipient of that seventh church age messenger. His message is now living in the hearts of a group of people called. A bride. Yes. All right? And so that's me and you. So we ought to praise God for that. Every day, we, we, we don't have to make ourselves odd. We already are odd. We don't have to make ourselves special. We already are special. God chose us to be in this age. He chose us to wind this thing up. So God's going to have a group that's going to wind this thing up. Because remember, I didn't know if I told you or not, but God don't make mistakes. Amen? He knows what he's doing, and he put the right people, just like we said before with, with um, Irenaeus. God put Irenaeus in the position he was supposed to be in at the time he was supposed to be in. Right. 
for the people that was there to respond to what he had said. Listen, there's no reason to have a messenger without somebody to respond to it. Because many times the messengers, we saw many times before, the messengers already gone off the scene about the middle of the church age. The church age is really just getting going. God takes his messenger off the scene. God does. Takes the messenger off the scene. God did that. He knows what he's doing. If he left that messenger on that scene so long, the people would continue to look to that person, look to that person, look to that person. He wants us to look to Christ and Christ alone. So let's read Revelation 2, verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he that hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest. Now I want you to watch. We'll background a little bit with Smyrna, but Pergamos, this age, keep in your mind this is the third age. All right, everybody with me. The third age, one, two, three. The, thir- the three ages in the first, first one, second one, Paul, Irenaeus, and Martin, Coming up, those three ages were the lion age, L-I-O-N, where the lion of the tribe of Judah, they spoke bold. But all of a sudden, their speaking bold is going to turn. And they're going to speak to a pope. Satan's going to be so much in there. I want you to watch how many times this scripture tells us about Satan. All right. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. All right. Remember, as we were taught before, that it wasn't in the synagogue, that they were uh, the synagogue of Satan. All right? And thou holdest fast my name. This is the last age that the Lord Jesus Christ's baptism is prevalent. Last age. From then on till just this day right now we're looking at, it was titles of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Because remember, during this time, and we'll look at it in a minute, the Nicene Council started 325 A.D., so that's about the time in this church age, all right? So what man started doing was, was he wrote in the word of God, all right? Amen. said, Thou holdest fast my name. There was a little group that held fast and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee because thou hast them that hold the doctrine. Watch. The doctrine of Balaam. Then you're going to see in just a minute, it's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. It's become a doctrine. It's not been a saying. It's not been a deed. It's become a doctrine. In other words, when you have a doctrine, it's incarnate. Brother Branham's doctrine was to restore us back to the faith of the fathers. That was his doctrine. And then to bring his message to an end time bride to take us out of here. All right. So he had that message and he had a doctrine. Brother Ram said a church without a doctrine is what? Not a church. Okay? So he, because thou hast them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. The Balak or Balaam of that time we know was Constantine. Constantine comes up about the end of this age and brings it into where he brings church and state together. All right, Brother Brown calls it, and we look, Pergamus means to be, or Pergamian means to be thoroughly married. You would think that we would be the ones that would be thoroughly married. We are now. They weren't then. It wasn't their job to be thoroughly married. It's our job to be the virgin bride of Jesus Christ with everything in order, everything the right way, no Father, Son, Holy Ghost baptism, no eternal hell and all those Doctrines that came into this doctrine of Balaam. And what did it do? It cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel or the bride of that age. Amen. Stumbling block. Didn't kill them. It stumbled them. To eat things sacrificed unto idols and commit fornication. So hast, look, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. And for all of y'all that's sitting here today, God, what? God hates. There's things he hates. He hates that. He hates the doctrine of Balaam. He hates the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So if we're attacked, anything attached to that, God's got to hate it. Now watch. He said, repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against him with the sword of my mouth. He's admonishing him. If it don't get back to the word, he's going to absolutely take the word and pretty much 
fight the whole time. And that's what happened in that middle church age, the fourth church age, which was darkness, all right, or the dark ages. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, look, there is an overcoming group. Remember, whatever they have to overcome, we have to overcome. That's why these church ages are so important. That's why I really went back and was reading them, <clears throat> the life of Irenaeus. We see the life of Paul it's in the Bible. But Irenaeus, thank God he's put somebody in there that would take down the acts of Irenaeus and the acts of Martin and all the different ones so that a prophet in the end time could tell us that's the star. He fits the characteristics of all these others because you had Polycarp, you had Antipas, and if you'll look up the Antipas, you hardly find anything about him at all. Brother Branham said in the church age book he couldn't find anything about him at all. But he must have been a prophet. He was a faithful martyr, and he was doing he was in the Bible. My faithful servant. That's why sometimes we think we can't find ourselves in the Bible and we're totally insignificant. We don't God. You're there. You're there. You're in the Bible. You're living the Bible. You are the Bible. You gotta believe that. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. Now where's the hidden manna? It didn't fall out in the outer court. Wasn't in the inner court. Huh? The hidden manna was in the Holy of Holies. So he's telling this group of people, I will have a group of people I will hide myself and feed. I'll hide them and feed them because I'm going to have a church that comes from this evil Pergamon church age. And I will give him a white stone and that white stone a new name. For those of y'all that are new, there's been a doctrine about that for years and years and years and years that Brother Brown is supposed to come back and give us that name. Amen. Well, let's just read the Bible. Can we just read the Bible? Can we just read that scripture that says, I will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written which no, read that with me, no one knoweth saving he that receiveth it. Amen. So it's to you. Somebody don't have to tell you. You'll know that name, whatever it is. You'll know what it is. God didn't say wait on the prophet and he'll tell you what your name is. Lazy people wait on things. I know. You already put the scripture in the mind, they that wait upon the Lord. There's a difference in that. Waiting is not going and sitting somewhere in the corner. That sign that says right up there, be still and know that I am God, that's exactly right inside here. But we got work to do. Remember, Brother Brown said God's waiting on us, not us waiting on him. We're not waiting on him to carry this thing on. He is waiting on us to get off and on. Get off our rear and get on with the message. That's what we're talking about here. There's nothing impossible to those that will try. Just try. Which no man knoweth save he that receiveth this. Receiveth it. Now remember the characteristics. There's an announcement in heaven. Out of the mind of God goes the Logos. It's a sealed up message that no one else gets except one messenger that saves the confusion. But then when that messenger receives that, then that becomes the mind of God in an individual. And what he says is the truth. Because it comes from the mind of God. God articulated this whole thing. But he had to wait until somebody like Paul got knocked off his high horse. Hello, somebody. So he could use him. So that mystery is then spoken to the star. He picks it up and says, that ain't nothing but the truth. Amen. But they have to stand alone, remember. Brother Ram had to stand alone. Paul had to stand alone. Paul said, I got this from no man. Wow. Listen, Brother Ram didn't get this from no man. He took things that he could read and he put things together, Clarence Larkin, the different ones, but the Holy Spirit gave him a message to give to me and you. He was the church age messengers. All those other ones, they had truth. They had truth. The Larkins and the different ones, they had truth. But they weren't messengers to the church of Laodicea. They didn't have a prophecy behind them as of Malachi 4, Luke 17, 30, and the different things. 
And I'll tell you, once we move through these church ages, when we get to that last church age, we're going to try to stop just a little bit, and we're going to talk about Brother Branham and what his message is and how it unfolded and why it was him, because he's got to meet the characteristics the same as Paul. If he's a star, he's got to meet that same characteristic. So mysteries unfolded to the star of the age, matching pieces. So a trumpet sounds. In other words, he begins to declare a message. Then a church age begins, and it's a distinct and declared message. It's something to me and you. Like Brother Brown said, he said, this is not to the world. Even on marriage and divorce, he brings it down even closer. He said, this is to my followers only. Not Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal. He said, to my followers only that believe. In other words, my message, this is to you. That's real narrow. And thank God for grace that a prophet had to give. He had to give one in several different ages. So God knew we'd need it. But it starts a spiritual war, the true word of God versus the false doctrines. And we see it now. We've seen it before. We've seen it when Brother Brown went off the scene. Who's going to be this? Who's going to be that? But that messenger's laid away or taken off the earth. But the people accepted or rejected. There was a group of people. There's a group of people sitting here today that's going to accept the message and go on or reject it and go somewhere else. You cannot stay neutral, folks. That's why you see people leaving the message. That's why you see people leaving church. You can't sit in a congregation with a word being preached and God convicts you. And if you don't take that conviction and bring it before God, you will have to leave. Brother Ram said, Ananias and Sapphira, which means, oh, I pay my tithe sometimes, brother. I pay it when I can. That's the same thing they asked Ananias. He said, oh, I'll give all. I'll give everything I got. Peter said, you lied. You didn't lie to me. You didn't lie to the church. You lied to the Holy Ghost. All right. <clears throat> Don't mean to scare you, but we need to pay our tithe. It's pretty simple. Brother Brown said only Christians will pay tithe. Right. Right. I can't believe some people don't know, don't know that catch up revelation. But anyway, Amen. but there's always true and false. But you won't be able to sit in this congregation as we continue on. And I'll give you a piece of what I want to talk about this afternoon. Listen, we've come to a place to where we've had, we've had the former reign. We've had the teaching reign. Brother Dale brought the teaching rain. Right. Brought it to us, pure and unadulterated. Amen. All right? Well, God saw to leave him there because he had a work to do. All right? But now he's not stopping. The door didn't shut. And listen, it's not all laid on me. You got work to do. We got to start living what the man taught. Yes, but listen, folks, the days of plenty is over. We had those times, as Brother Brandon was talking about, that Israel enjoyed their millennium during Solomon's time. They enjoyed wealth. They enjoyed fortune. They enjoyed power, being a powerful <coughs> group of Israel. Amen? But there was a time come when all that went away. They went into captivity. What are you saying, Brother Wade? Well, you know, the times of us spending a whole lot of money, probably over. It's going to get worse, folks, than it gets better. It's going to get worse. Out here, cosmos, world order is going to get worse. Look at Iran. They're throwing missiles at Israel. Brother Brown said watch Russia, but he also said if you want to know what time it is, he said you watch Israel. Israel, the guy stood up this morning. I was watching him online from the Mossad. He stood up and he said, he looked right at the camera and he said, Iran don't know what kind of mistake they just made. So Israel was ready for it. We had already, our intelligence forces three weeks ago had proclaimed that Iran was going to shoot missiles at them. And that guy said, look out, Iran. We're already in your country. We're already in your country. They wasn't waiting on them to fire rockets. That's what God's people do. They act. Yeah. 
They don't wait on the devil. They said, we're God's people. God's give us this intelligence. No one is going to stand before us. He said, we're already in your country, Iran. He said, get ready. A little piece of ground, not much bigger than from where Brother Ben's from, Connecticut. Maybe not even Rhode Island, it's not that big. That little piece of ground has been fought. It has been destroyed 17 times in history up until the modern ages. But that guy looked at the camera and he said, you know, they tried to kill us in, I think it was 30-something. They tried to annihilate us in 45, you know, with the Holocaust. He said they tried in 47. He said they tried in 67. He said they tried in 83. He said, we're still Israel. God protect Israel. But there'll be a day come, though, that this country, and I'm not prophesying. Brother Ram's already told this. You watch and see. When we turn Israel down, when we quit, when we go to say, all right, now you need to stop that. Iran will give you some more stuff. That's the day that we'll get our judgment. It'll begin that day. Because the Bible tells us whoever's a friend of Israel is a friend of God. Whoever's an enemy of Israel is an enemy of God. That's why they don't care. Iran's 50 times bigger than the, than the state of Israel. Israel on the mountain just about that big. Iran's about that big. Launched them missiles, and I think one or two hit the ground out somewhere and didn't even hit anything. That Iron Dome killed every, all those other missiles that they were seeing. Just telling you, judgment is coming. And when we turn God down as a nation... And they'll start ripping us up. That's when the persecution will come. That's why I said the times of plenty is probably over. The times of survival is upon us. But we're built for it. Israel was built for it. They made it. They went in the promised land. A lot of them didn't, but the ones that were supposed to did. <clears throat> so spiritual death comes on those who reject their messenger. So the next days come, same thing happens. There's an announcement. So now we see that it, the announcement has went to Irenaeus. Irenaeus has lived his life. He has passed away. We'll look at it in just a second. He's, he's moved on, passed away. He's laid away, but the message continued on. But that message began, began to get pulled apart. Well, God's not, that wasn't, that wasn't God. Uh, that was uh, a created substance from God named Jesus. That's what it's coming to in 325 A.D. They didn't make that happen in 325. They waited a little bit later, and then they made it happen. Amen. All right? So out of the mind of God comes the Logos, a sealed-up message open. So the mystery now is getting ready to come to a man named St. Martin. So remember the age of Pentecost? The messenger was the Holy Ghost. The Alpha Age was the Ephesian Church Age. Get this thing to moving. So now remember, Paul died at 64 to 67. The Ephesian age ended at 170. So now we come into a new age, which would be bear with me. All right, we see there the messenger comes, Paul comes, Irenaeus comes, and now what's going to happen? There's another porter or another messenger getting ready to step in that overlap, and his name is St. Martin. And we'll look and see what St. Martin did here in just a second. All right? And they always come in the lap over. Now watch, also Brother Brown said, look, every evil that was in the first church age lapped over into the next one. Just keep going on down till it ends up in complete apostasy in this day right here. Now, remember, he knew where the seat of Satan was. He knew where the synagogue of Satan was. He knew the deeds of the Nicolaitans. He knew the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. God knew that. But it's all piled up in the end time now. It's all come down here where Satan's trying to conquer the laity. He's trying to give a doctrine of Balaam, what? Which made a stumbling block for the people. There's true bride. Come on, church. Remember. Remember, though, remember the vision Brother Branham had. That last bride did stumble. Hello? That last bride got out of step just a little bit, 
And the prophet had to say, remember, he woke up saying, get back in line. Well, that's us. We need to get back in line to fulfill this prophecy. Because we are coming into complete apostasy right now. Satan will be in his seat. He will be in his tabernacle. He will be in his synagogue right about the time we get ready to get out of here. He's going to incarnate a pope, which he's never done before. He's used them. He's anointed them. But now he's going to become it. Everybody with me? Listen, so hallelujah. We might have been like God. We might have had these doctors over here, but there's going to be a church. Right now today that is God on the earth. That will be Mrs. Jesus Christ. It will not be fooled by doctrine contrary to the word of God. So the lap over is a grace to the people, and we'll look at that more when we get to the last church age. Because remember, after the last church age, there is no lap over. It abruptly stops. Gentile church is done. Uh, Brother Tim and I were talking the other day. Uh, we're all, everybody's looking for that last one, right? You know, we make that quote. We're looking for the last seed. We're looking for the last one to come in. Now, let's go to, I think, the adoption series where Brother Bradham said, he said, when the door of the Gentile church closes, that means the last one comes in. He said, God will anoint a church then. He said, in one year, God will do more than theologists did in 2000, one year after the doors closed. If we believe Brother Brown was a prophet. Listen, what I'm saying is, when the last one comes in, if we say, oh, that's, that's, you know, Brother Michael, and when, boom, when he gets born again, we're just going to disappear. That's not going to happen. We may be here another year, but the power of God will be so much in the bride till the world will once see us one time. We'll be on display one time to the world. You can either be part of it or you can be part of the world. That's your choice. So the Smyrna church age, we know what Smyrna was, was what? Bitter, myrrh, death. Comes from the word myrrh. It's used in embalming the dead. So we'll look what Brother Brown says, look. Thus we have a twofold significance found in the name of the age. It was a bitter age filled with death. The two vines were in the framework of the church. Listen, Paul knew those vines were growing already in the first church age. Right. Right. Grievous wolves, he called them, yeah, right. would come among the group. Listen, Satan always wants to be where the word is. Yes, sir. Right. That's, right. That's why he's not bothering the world. He's already got them if they're not born again. Right. He's after me and you. Yes. To try to get us to slip up one little bit. Yes. Like Brother Bob said, quit coming to church and quit doing the things you're supposed to do. Right. Brother Brown said, how can I teach them doctrine if they don't do their ABCs? Right? right? We wonder why we have problems. Like I said before a few Sundays ago, check yourself up. I do believe in checklists. I like them because it keeps you... Checked up. But are you checking all the boxes? Come to church every time doors open. Pay my tithe. Read my Bible. Pray for the pastor. Pay for the deacons. Pray for everybody. Pray for the sick. Are we still checking off? Have we missed one bar? Have we missed a box somewhere? If we have, you need to go back to that box. I didn't tell you that. God did. Brother Brown said, how can I teach them doctrine if they don't know their ABCs? Amen. People struggle. Dad's always said, he said, I don't need a list to tell me who pays tithes and who don't. He said, I watch and see. People that struggle don't pay their tithe. Amen. We love to quote Brother Dale until we quote that and it goes. <laughs> <laughs> we love to quote the Bible until it goes. <laughs> Full frontal, nothing in the back. But that's the truth, people. It's the truth. Without God, without doing what he said, you'll struggle. We're going to struggle enough if we check all the boxes. You're going to struggle enough if you check them all off. But Satan can get in one box. He'll get in it. And what does he do when he gets in it? He don't just sit there. 
He's a vine. He's going to grow and make you worse. Brother Brown said, take the joy right out of you. Wow. Well, let's fix that. That's annoying. So the two vines within the framework of the church were drifting further apart with an increased bitterness toward the true vine on part of the false. Death was not only the seed of the false vine, but even in the true vine, there was a creeping paralysis. Listen to this. A creeping paralysis. This is the true vine. A creeping paralysis and impotence because they had already drifted from the unadulterated truth of the first few years after Pentecost. This is the second age. Now watch, and no true believer is any stronger and spiritually healthy and alive than his knowledge of and adherence to the pure word of God. That's what I said before. Check all the boxes. The word of God tells us to do something. If we don't do it and we know to do it and don't do it, <coughs> that's why the Bible says in the end time iniquity will abound. What's iniquity? It's right in front of your face. You know not to do that, but you run that stop sign anyway. Okay. As seen by multitudes of examples in the Old Testament, organization was growing apace, confirming and augmenting the death of the membership. For Holy Ghost leadership was deposed and the word was replaced by creeds, dogmas, man-made rituals. This is just, just, we're still in the second church age. All right. When Israel went into captivity, they had a priesthood, a temple, and the word. When they came out, they had rabbis, theological order, Pharisees, synagogue, and the Talmud. And Jesus called them, you're of your father, the devil. That church age started around 170 to A.D. 312. The messenger was Irenaeus. He was born in 130 A.D. He died in 202. So he died about in the middle of the church age. So somebody picked his message up. He was a message. He was a student of John the Revelator. So was, I mean, Polycarp. But he wasn't militant against the Nicolaitan system for he himself leaned toward organization. He's talking about Polycarp. But with Irenaeus, this was not so. He was militant against any form of organization. And we're going to see Martin the same way. Listen, God knows how to choose a man. Amen. I don't know if y'all know that or not, but God don't make a mistake. Okay. So when he come to Martin, Martin just fit the mold because Martin was a soldier. Martin was in the army for years until he had an experience. So he was militant already. He was already against things that were evil. So he just brought it on, and God just anointed that part and just brought it right on in. Amen. He had much manifestation. We're still talking about Irenaeus now. He taught it with unusual clarity and conformity to its original precept. His church in France was known to have gifts of the Spirit. Saints spoke in tongues, prophesied, raised the dead, healed the sick. He saw the danger of any kind of organized brotherhood among the elders, pastors, etc. He stood solidly for a unified, spirit-filled, gift-manifesting local church. And God honored him for the power of God manifestation, manifested among the saints. So he was clearly the man for the hour. Brother Brown said, look, it is altogether unfortunate that the other ages did not have in their messenger such a balance of fruit, power, and leadership in the Holy Spirit and the Word. Irenaeus said, the glory of God is man fully alive. He had a real good understanding of one true living God. Jesus, the incarnate word, is a meeting place between God and humanity. He wrote the book against heresies, which was against the Gnostics. The Gnostics said it was many gods or two gods or three gods. He was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John the Revelator. He set the four gospels as the canon of scripture. There's other things he did in his life. But the central point of Irenaeus' theology is the unity and goodness of God. He knew there was one true and living God. He did not stand for a trinity. He did not stand for two gods or one like substance of God, as Serentius was, uh, started that um, doctrine. Amen. So in opposition to the Gnostics, and they just have all kind of gods, whatever. So Irenaeus used the word logos. He inherited from Justin Martyr. Irenaeus was a student of Polycarp, as we said before. And they used that word logos. So unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which is dead and is alive. Now, that's unusual because we're alive and then we die. But this man died so that you could live. He's talking about Jesus Christ. Then watch, he knows the works of the people. 
There he is, the chief shepherd of the flock. But does he hold back the persecution? Does he stem the tribulation? No, he does not. He said, I know thy works and thy tribulation. I know that. But I'm not going to stop it because you need it. Same way with us. It's church. Tribulation. Brother Brown, look, we'll read it in just a minute. No, he does not. What a stumbling block this is to so many people. Like Israel, they wonder if God really loves them. How can God be just and loving if he stands by and watches his people suffer? You cannot figure out God's love. They thought that love meant no suffering. They thought that love meant a baby with parental care. But God said his love was elective love. The proof of his love is election that no matter what happened, his love was what? Proven truly by the fact that they were chosen unto salvation because God chooses you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit, believing the truth. He may commit you to death as he did Paul. He may commit you to suffering as he did Job. This is his prerogative. But remember, he's sovereign, but it all happens for a purpose. God can't take his children and turn them into the devil. He takes the devil's kids, praise God, and turns them into his kids. Amen. That's his election. He knows there's going to be a group of people. He knows what we need. He knows, Lula Church, what we need to carry on through the next days, weeks, months, years, and ever how long till the rapture of the church. He knows that. And he has a purpose in doing it. If he did not have a purpose, he would be the author of frustration and not of peace. His purpose is that after we have suffered a while, we would be made perfect, established, strengthened, and settled. Remember, Jesus was the same way. Why does he stand by? Here's the reason. And if we're children, then heirs, heirs of God. Now, we're going to be joint heirs. If so be that we might suffer with him, that we may be also glorified Together, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. If we take this little part of life that we live, ever how many years you've lived and, and, and ever how many years we're going to live until the rapture comes or we pass, it's just a small amount of time. And it is, it's an effort. I know it's an effort to come to church because I do it. Like Sister June says, she know it's an effort for you sisters to, oh, it, you know, it'd be just, I guess, you know, let me just tell you this. It would be wonderful to just, if my hair, if, you know, if you got all this hair going this way, just cut it off. That's what we do. We got hair standing up, we just trim it off. Because it's not an example that you sisters are in Scripture. You're an example of purity and obedience. Yes. In obedience to what the Bible says. So it's a joy. If you get up in the morning and you have to put your long hair up and you're saying words you shouldn't say, you need a new birth. Don't ever complain about your hair. If you complain about your hair, then you need a new birth. Oh, I know. Some say it's falling out, and it is. You can't help that. But you can help putting the scissors in your hand. And you know what? The glory that's going to be revealed in us is that God's going to turn one day and say, look, they did it. They did it. I wrote it. They did it. What's your problem? That's where God is a judge. But he's a righteous judge. Unless we suffer with him, we cannot reign with him. You have to suffer to reign. The reason for this is the character simply never is never made without suffering. Characters of what? Victory, not a gift. A man without character can't reign because power apart from character is what? Satanic. But power with character is fit to rule. And since he wants us to share his throne on the same basis he overcome and sat down on the Father's throne, then we have to overcome to sit with him. Right. There's a lot of obstacles that you overcome every day to be a Christian. Amen. Even little ones, like today. You know, you got people today, and not here, but you got people that are just people out in the world 
to, Sunday's the day they go party. They'll go to the to the to the lake. They'll go to the picnic. They'll go to the ball game. They'll go and and they'll stay home and they'll make their house look so pretty. Pretty house, that one ain't going to be in heaven. Right? right? I was talking to somebody the other day, and can't remember who it was, but all these fineries that we have ain't going to be over there. All these fineries, it's good to keep your house clean. It's good for all this stuff. But what are you building? You building something for here? Is this more important than what's what there? Think about that. Is this more important? Everything here, I got to build this thing here. If it consumes us, if we, like I said before, if we have to stay out of church on Sunday to do something that you purposely wait till Sunday to do, you're lost. You're lost. Period. You're lost. This day is a sacred day to a Christian. Amen. People will wait till Sunday to do something and they'll call you and say, well, I got to do this on Sunday. We got to overcome. What do we have to overcome? The urge to do something else. The urge to go do something else. Because we're sitting in a hot building, you're listening to a boring preacher and you're, you're wanting it to be finished so you can go eat. And they're out there having fun. They got their Budweiser, their Bud Light, and they're out there on the lake, and they got their cooler. Donnie, you did it. Go out there and get the cooler and get out on the boat. He's going like this. Go out on the boat and just, oh, God, I'm enjoying life. A little temporary suffering we go through now is not worthy to be compared to the tremendous glory. Look, that be, will be revealed in us. Yes. Because he's coming back for us. He's not coming back for the world. The world will never see him until the day of judgment. Praise God. You and I will have three and a half years of wedding supper with him. Eye to eye, face to face. Then we'll have a millennium where we'll walk with him and talk with him and be eternal and not have to worry about Monday. This little temporary suffering. If they did it in those ages, you and I can do it in this age. If you get the urge to do something contrary to the word of God, what brother I'm say to do? Don't go get in your closet and try to do, you know, look at the, and find Brother Random's picture. And what'd he say? He said, do the opposite. If you don't feel like going to church, try going to church sometime. Can I have an amen? amen? Brother Bob did, but the rest of you, I don't know. Some of these mumbles, but try to come to church. Try to try to overcome what you're what you're going through. Right. Try to overcome it. That's right. I'm not throw, I'm not saying anything to build you up, but she should be home, sitting in a chair. She has a torn ligament or some kind of muscle in her leg, and she's sitting there a few minutes ago. And every once in a while, it'll tighten up so bad she'll start crying. She's sitting here. She's overcome. God has to. Listen, God has to do what his word says. He has to come to that and honor it somehow. That's overcoming. Oh, what treasures are laid up for those who are willing. Look, willing to enter into his kingdom through much tribulation. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trials that are to try you. Now, he's reading Bible. That is what Peter said. Is it strange that God wants us to develop Christ-like character that comes through suffering? No, sir. Is it? It's not strange. We will have trials. We are all tried and chastened as sons. Not one but goes through that. Listen, this is a quote I was coming to. Brother Ram said, the church that is not suffering and is not being tried hasn't got it. It isn't of God. Brother Bobby was talking about Brother Ron Spencer praying at that prayer line. Do you know he went home Monday and had a heart attack? Had to take him to the hospital. He had 100% blockage in one, 90% in another, and the Widowmaker, the one that takes you out, 70% blocked. 
They took him to UVA. All of his cancer team came there. Actually, they came to the hospital. I was talking to um, uh, Brother Nate Green stopped by. He's preaching for Brother <clears throat> Brother Dutch Scott today. But uh, the whole team from UVA, University of Virginia Hospital, come down and got him. And the people at this little hospital, I mean, they did all they could do. You can only do so much. They said, well, we can do the hunt. We can fix the hunter, but we can't touch the 70 or the 30 because we, you won't make it through it. So he calls UVA team. The UVA team, praise God for them group of people. They come, they come down there and picked him up. Took him an hour to UVA. They fixed all three. All three of them. And he's home now. But you're talking about, I mean, that's what he did that prayer line with. And taking, listen, he takes 30 cancer pills a day. A day. They're only, he said, they're only keeping that cancer at bay. That's all they're doing. But praise God, for two years, it hadn't moved one bit. It hasn't grown. It hasn't, and that didn't metastasize to his brain. And then remember, it went in his eyes. You remember that. Now he's healed of that. Amen. He's a true Job, that's for sure. But yeah, when you said that the other day, I didn't know it. But then uh, uh, Brother Nate came and said, you know, Brother Ron had a heart attack? I said, no. He said, had it Monday when he left, when he came back from Louisiana camp. So he had that fiery two-hour prayer line with a 100% blocked artery. A 90% blocked artery and a 70% blocked Widowmaker. If you don't know what that Widowmaker is, that's why it's called a Widowmaker. Because it will make you, if you're married, a widow. 70% blocked. But thank God he had a team that come and got him, took him up to UVA, and they took care of every bit of that. So he's a living testimony. But, but listen, through suffering, through suffering, he has become just a beacon of faith. Through suffering. That man takes 30 cancer pills a day. Sometimes he throws up all the time. He throws up before he preaches. Right. And we got problems. We can't get to church because... <laughs> For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. Get quiet. Now, this special condition in Smyrna must be applied to every age. There is no age free from it. There is no true believer free from it. This is of God. This is the will of God. It is needful. We need the Lord to teach us the truth that we are to suffer and be Christ-like in doing it. Love suffereth long and is kind. So now let's look at the word, look at Pergamos. That was the, the um, we got the Ephesian age, Smyrnian age. Now we're going into Pergamos, all right? The Pergamos means thoroughly married. So what's going to happen is whatever were sayings and deeds in these first two church ages, they're going to become doctrines so that it's preached now freely in churches. Everybody with me? It's preached freely in churches now. Today is preached freely in churches. Doctrine of Balaam Amen. and the doctrine of Nicolaitans is being preached all over the world right now. But it had its seed or its, rep, its part of beginning right here in Pergamos. So let's read Revelations 2.12. To the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he that hath sharp sword with two edges. What's the, what's the sword? Sword's the word. All right. Has two edges. Cuts going in, cuts coming out. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where in Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. He probably got in somebody's business and they killed him. And it probably wasn't a drunk. It was probably somebody that goes to church. Hello, somebody. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. God can't change his mind. Amen. All right? Can't change his mind. If you hated it in a baby form, he hated it in this form. Yes. 
Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Listen, when God starts a battle, he always wins. I don't want him to start a battle against me. He's going to win somewhere. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and that stone a new name, which no one knoweth save he that receives it. So just hang on. If you get a new name, I'm not going to be able to tell it to you. You're going to have to get it for yourself. Right. Isn't that what that says? Right. Not a prophet's got to come back and tell me what my new name is. Right. I think he already called us bride. <laughs> he already called us Christian. He already called us Mrs. Jesus Christ. We've had a wedding. When you have a wedding, you have a name change. Right here. Not there, right here. So this age lasted from 312 to 606. And then remember, there was a council of Nicaea in 325 AD. So it happened kind of right at the beginning of this. The messenger was St. Martin. He lived from 315 to 399. And all of you remember that when he was a soldier... He gave his coat to a beggar. He couldn't give it all to him, so he cut it and gave half of it to a beggar. We all know that. And then the Lord Jesus came that night and presented himself to St. Martin, and he had half of the coat on, so he knew that Jesus was there. And there was symbol, but he was showing Martin that, hey, what you've done to my little ones, you've done it unto me. Well, he was converted. Then he went to see a person that was, had some kind of authority, and he went to see him in court. Well, guess what? The court wouldn't see him. Mm. Mayor's busy. You'll get that in a minute. The mayor's busy. So Mark says, I need to see him. So he's busy. So about that time, the mayor got a hot seat. God sent a fireball down and set his rear end on fire and the seat he was sitting in. And he actually saw Martin after that. At least he had a little bit of sense. Then remember that one time that he was talking to that group that was against him and he said, okay, if God be for us, let's stand right here. Tie me to a tree that's, that's on a slope this way. Tie me underneath it. And he said, if God kills me, then, you know, whatever. Take it. It's yours. Well, you know what happened? They chopped that tree down, and when it did, it not only turned up the hill, it killed the ones that cut the tree down. Up this way, not that way. Up this way. So what a powerful man. And he also, there's a, um, uh, there's a relic that, that I was looking online. It's pretty interesting, and it's a hatchet because Martin was known to cut down idols. Any kind of worship, trees, idols, altars, he had an axe about this big, and it had a great big head on the end of it, and that was known as St. Martin's Axe, and he would go and tear everything apart. How militant is that? Amen. He said, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, but you hold as fast my name. Like I said before, this is the last church age that the name of the Lord Jesus will ever be used in baptism in, a, in, a, in the form like, you understand? Uh, um, accepted practice until now. Right. It'll always be Father, Son, Holy Ghost after that, and they'll do away with the name. But there's a group that holdeth fast my name and has not denied my faith. Even in those days were Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Right. But I have a few things against thee, because there is them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. I wrote myself a note. There's two things, two doctrines God hates. He hates the Balaam, doctrine of Balaam, and he hates the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. He said, repent, or else I will come unto you quickly and will fight against you with the sword of my mouth. Listen to Brother Adam is real quick. We'll be done right here. Thus, by the time of this third church age, we have two churches bearing the same name. Now, look, bearing the same name, but one with a bitter difference between them. Right. One has departed from the truth, married idols, and has no life in her. Does that sound familiar? Amen. It's happening today. Yeah. They have no life if they don't have the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen? Right. 
She has hybridized herself and the signs of death, not life, follow in her wake. She is powerful, many members, favored by the world. The other is a little persecuted group, but she follows the word and signs follow her. The sick are healed, the dead are raised. She's alive with life and the word of God. She loves not her life, but holds to his name and his faith even unto death. And so the terrible persecution of official Rome fell upon the true believers until Constantine. Now watch, watch how, watch how slick the devil is. Just for a second before we close. Let's how slick this guy is. Now what does Constantine do? Constantine comes up and brings church and state together. He sees all this property. He's got all this money. He puts them both together and makes synagogues and all these different things. He sends people out on crusades, right? Seems to be the nice guy that brought all that together. That was the devil. But watch how the devil works. Rome was persecuting the believers. Everybody with me now, watch. This was so astounding. Rome, say Rome was the devil. The devil is persecuting true believers until Constantine. Constantine sees that. He arose and granted freedom of religious worship. Seems like a nice guy. But there seems to be two reasons why this freedom was granted. In the first place, various good emperors had not allowed persecution, but as they passed on, they were followed by those who killed Christians. It was so senseless that it finally came to public head that the Christians ought to be left alone. That's the devil saying that. The second and best noted reason is that Constantine had a very difficult battle ahead of him. We know the story of that. In taking over the control of the empire. One night in a dream, he saw a white cross. That's why they called him crossbacks. He thought he was doing it for God. He was putting it together for the devil. Brother Brown called that the dark ages. When church and state married. Ahab and Jezebel married was in the Old Testament. And this was where Jezebel and Ahab married in our time. But I want you to watch what he says. One night in a dream, he saw white crosses appear before him. He felt that this was an omen unto him that if the Christians prayed for a victory for him, he would win the battle. He promised freedom for them in the event he was victorious. He was victorious, and the freedom of worship was granted in the Edict of Nantes, 312 AD. But, but, this freedom from persecution to death was not as monogamous as it first appeared. Constantine was now the patron. As a patron, his interest was somewhat more than that of an observer, for he decided that the church needed his help. God don't need help. He had seen them disagreeing over various matters, one of them which involved Arius, Bishop of Alexander, who taught his adherents that Jesus was not truly God, now watch, but a lesser God having been created by God. Yeah, kind of the way it is today. The Western church held the opposite view, believing that Jesus was the very essence of God, as they said, co-equal with the Father. With such matters, along with the intrusion of pagan ceremony into worship, the, in, the emperor called for the Nicene Council in 325 A.D. with the thought that he would bring all the groups together where they could iron out their differences and come to a common understanding. Let's just all get together. And all, the, and all be one. Isn't it peculiar that though this started with Constantine, it didn't die, but it's very much alive today. That was the seed for the World Council of Churches, which is going to head up, and that's the one that's going to persecute the bride. The World Council of Churches started back there with Constantine bringing church and state together, making them powerful, giving them land, giving them authority to do things, letting them worship the way they want to until Constantine come to a place to where, remember he said, in other words, my Christianity is the one you got to to come to. If you don't come to my Christianity, we're going to kill you. So you see now we're heading into the dark ages where 68 million Christians that's the next age we're getting into. 68 million Christians. Million. 68 million Christians. That's about the population of, of California and a couple of other states. 
68 million people were killed because they said they were Christians, but not the kind of Christian Constantine wanted them to be. Wow. And where he failed to truly achieve it, it will be achieved in this day through the ecumenical move. Amen. Folks, we're at the end time. Right there. That thing that happened in 325 A.D., read about it. Really what happened in 325 A.D., they didn't come to any conclusion like Constantine wanted them to. <clears throat> That's why he started persecuting them. Then in 606 A.D., it's when they really come up with all this and said, all right, this is law. You're baptized in this way. This is what it's going to be. We have Apostles' Creed. We have all this. this. There'll be a pope now, and you'll listen to this pope. That's how it all got started. Well, guess what? That's what's going to happen right now. We got religious freedom. Stand, let's stand our feet. We got religious freedom when we came here in America, right? We got religious freedom. But what was it, though? It's the birthplace of where the World Council of Churches is going to head up. Right here in this nation. But it started out true. But somewhere it turned false. Listen, let's don't let our life do that. Let's don't let our life start out true and, and we start it out because how many, many times we see that, that God says, I have somewhat against you because you've left something. I have somewhat against you. I love you. You take my name. Some of you still hold my name. Some of you still do the things that I want you to do. But there's a group of you that I have somewhat against. We pray that we're not in that group. It's checking up time. For all of you. For all of us. We're heading into a new era. Okay? We're heading into a, not a new way, but we're heading into something that we might have not have thought five years ago we'd ever come this way. Everybody with me? This is the fact. We're standing here alive. And the way we deal with it is going to determine our future. Everybody with me? All right. <clears throat> and to, uh, to you sisters, I, again, I apologize, but I'd like to just speak to the men first. And um, you're very important. You're extremely important. You're the to, you're the you're the backbone. You're the remember you're the fifth gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the mom. That's what Brother Bram said. All right. That's what you are, and we appreciate you and we love you. But there are certain things that we need to discuss. That that sometimes emotion gets involved, and sometimes you know a lot of things get involved that that sisters can't handle. Now I'm not I'm going to tell you what Brother Brown said that y'all are more a thousand more times confused than we are, or can be, right? Boy, you don't get many amens out of that, but it's in print. <laughs> it's in print. He said it. All right, I'm, listen. Why you get mad at me? Right. I'm just telling you what Brother Brown said thousand times more confused all right well let's just keep it that all the confusion out and i know some of you are just absolutely in the word of god lighthouses stellar you get behind your husband though because remember remember this one thing we still believe brother Bram was a prophet right Amen. brother Bram said you sisters will never give an account of the brothers but you brothers will give an account for your wife. Can I say that one more time? Since y'all are silent, I'm going to say it again. So you can hear what I said. Brother Brown said, you sisters, you're free from that. You're free from, from being deacons and having to make raw decisions sometimes that, that maybe are, are, are uh, against your emotion, um, against your love. Right? Because you can be deceived more than we can. And I'm sorry. That's what that's just the way the makeup is. That's why Brother Brown, you know, that's why God said there'll be no pastors that are women. There'll be no pastors that are deacons. Is everybody with me on this? I, I, and you sisters should glory in that. All you got to do is, is take care of your husband. Sure, you got a job. Sure, some of you don't have husbands. But your husband is Christ. Please take care of him. He's the one that married you. He's one is, he's more important to me than June is. Sorry, you got to put it that way. 
but he gave you a good wife, then cherish her. Listen to her. But there has to be one controlling factor, and that has to be the men. And like I said before, I don't apologize for saying it. I apologize if I hurt your feelings and it's like, well, you're excluding us. You ought to be happy that you don't have to stand up here and listen to phone calls three or four times a day and, and, and different things and have to handle stuff. I, I, I want to tell you something real quick. I watched my dad wear himself out for you guys. Okay. Everybody with me? In the 90s, before I came to the Lord, remember, I think I told you this one time before, I wasn't serving the Lord in the early part of the 90s. So Dad would be sitting here and, you know, dealing with y'all. I mean, some of you weren't here, but he was dealing with situations in the church. And and I thought, man, he's the rock of Gibraltar. This guy, he'd come to my house and he'd sit down and he'd have a look on his face like, I ain't never seen before. And he'd say, hey, would you just put on a hunting video? Would you put something on so we can watch? And Ryan, I knew then he was having, trying to deal. He took, listen, he took something home with him that he was dealing with in his mind as a human being, trying to, trying to uh, stand between God and the people and do the right thing and not do it partial, not do it leaning toward one side, but he'd say, just, just put on a hunting video and let's watch a hunting video. He won't talk about nothing. We'd eat, you know, and, and fellowship a little bit as family, but he's just like, you know, I, I just, I'm, I want to get away from this. But that's the burden that a pastor has. And I, and I appreciate your, um, your vote of confidence. And like I said before, the ones of you that didn't vote for me, I, give me some time. I hadn't done this before. Just love me. If I quit preaching the word of God, you have a right to leave. Yep. Rest of the time, kind of hang on, okay? I'm going to try to preach the Word of God and let everybody kind of just, you know, uh, I'm not Brother Dale. Um, it's a different administration. It, it's going to be, it, and it is, we hate change. We're humans. But we got to, go, as I said in this, look, the way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing. Right. 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 And I appreciate all you sisters in this church you work your fingers to the bone but get behind your husband don't be his enemy he's got enough don't be be his be his lover be his strength be the one he can cry on their shoulder if he needs to be that for your husband you say well my husband just sits in a pew he got problems too hello right he got problems too but I love y'all. And until God takes me away from this place, then we're going to try to preach the word of God the best we can. We're going to try to make decisions that helps each and every one of you, including the sisters. But today, this afternoon, we're just going to meet with the brothers and just look at some things because they are the heads of state. They do uh, run the part of the church. We're an organism, not an organization. And an organism has many things that we need to work with. We appreciate you sisters that teach Sunday school. But according to Brother Branham, Sunday school teachers up until about a uh, teenage can be a woman. But after that, a man should be the one. And that's what we have that here. And that's fine. Stay in your place. I read a quote yesterday. Brother Branham said, deacons don't try to be trustees. Pastors don't try to be deacons. Trustees don't try to be board of directors. Sit in your position. So, sisters, you got a position. And it's very honorable. No dishonor at all. Because God said, if he called the man, through Brother Branham, if he called the man, he called the wife too. Okay? So as much as he called Brother Dale, he called Sister Dale too. And just pray for the family. Let's sing a song before we dismiss. Oh, I just come to glorify, glorify.
we went over a little bit, let's wait and start at 1.30. 1.30. We'll meet back in here. No preliminary. 1.30. We'll meet here and start the meeting. Don't please come in at 1.35. 1.30. Be here at 1.30, and we'll get started. God bless you. We love you with the love of the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we've heard from you today. We, we pray, Lord, that... What's been said has been pleasing to you, Lord, but it, it will sink into the heart of the believers that, Lord, we have, we have to overcome. There's things we have to have prayer for and pray for, Lord. As we constantly pray without ceasing of the different things that are going on in many people's lives around the world, the bride, Lord, I pray that you would, each one, that you would minister to each one individually, that we will hear reports, Lord, that, that things have been changed, mountains have been moved, spirits have been done away with. Lord, you're that kind of a God that you'll come on the scene if we ask you. So we ask you, Lord, in your precious and holy name, Jesus Christ, to minister to each one of us, Lord, and be with us, Lord, as we go downstairs and eat a bite, Lord, and come back at 1.30. Lord, with our brothers, Lord, I pray that the spirit of sweetness would continue as it is right now, Lord, will be among us in a way, Lord, that there'll be no bitterness and guile and anything, Lord, that will all bind together. And Lord, just pray that we will get out of this place real fast and let the world just fall apart and we'll go into another dimension and we'll be protected and then come back here Lord and live with you for a thousand years on this very earth and then we'll go to our future home father what awaits us we can't explain it we can't understand it but you're the one that made it you're the one that made the way so you're the one that's going to Explain a little bit of it to us now, and then we'll see more when it comes to pass. In Jesus' name, we ask these things, Lord. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Sweet spirit, sweep over my soul.